Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. My name is Khalid Jameel. I'm a second year medical student. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, Dr. Khalid's three lectures, uh, cell biology. Uh, now, before I start, lucky for you guys, Dr. Khalid is giving these lectures. Um, they have potential for very difficult questions, but alhamdulillah, as Dr. Khalid uh, usually gives very simple uh, questions. All you need to know is the basic concepts, and that's what I'll try to do today, inshallah. I'll try to establish all the basic concepts you'll need to answer his questions. So let's get started. Uh, in this lecture, we'll talk about the parathyroid gland and parathyroid hormone, uh, calcium, phosphate, and the regulation. Uh, then we'll talk about some diseases associated with bone and calcium. And finally, uh, we'll talk about the clinical aspect of uh, this field. So before we start, uh, we all know what bone is. It's the mechanic, it forms the mechanical support for our body. It's also the main reservoir for calcium. So 99% of calcium in the body is stored in the bone. Uh, it, it also houses the hematopoietic tissue or the bone marrow uh, where red blood cells and white blood cells are formed. And finally, it helps in uh, regulation of some hormones, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, calcium. Calcium is also one of the uh, very important ions in our body. Uh, it's the storage of calcium, 99% of it, as we mentioned, is stored in the bone as hydroxyapatite. This is the formula. Uh, now, the remaining 1%, 0.9% of calcium is inside the cells and 0.1% is in the extracellular fluid, whether it was in the plasma or in the tissue. Now, one might ask, why is it so little in the extracellular fluid? That's because calcium, as you should know by now, is very important in many body mechanisms, like cardiac muscle contraction, skeletal muscle contraction, nerve transmission. Therefore, the levels of calcium in the blood should be very tightly regulated because any slight increase or decrease in calcium can cause a lot of problems. Uh, now, the only source for calcium is dietary intake, so it cannot be synthesized in the body. The only form is dietary intake. Now, uh, in the extracellular fluid, this 0.1% is found in three forms. The first form is free ionized calcium, so just as calcium ions, and this is the only active form. So unless this form is increased or decreased, you cannot say there's hypo or hypercalcemia. The only the only form we take into consideration and has an active uh, function is the free ionized calcium. It also exists as a, uh, bound to proteins like albumin, or it can also be bound to anions like uh, hydrogen carbonate or uh, phosphate ions. And this is important and we'll uh, come to know why later. Okay. So any, any, any ion, calcium ion that's bound to, for example, phosphate or bicarbonate is not active. It doesn't have any function. It doesn't have any effect. Okay. It has to be free ionized calcium. As for the regulation of calcium, as we said, it has to be very tightly regulated, and that's why you have a lot of mechanisms that regulate calcium. The main one is parathyroid hormone, and it increases calcium levels. It aims to increase calcium levels. Uh, the second one is vitamin D, and it also increases calcium levels. And finally, calcitonin, which is the only, uh, the only hormone that decreases calcium levels in the blood. Okay, all clear until now? So now let's start talking about the parathyroid gland. First of all, let's talk about its structure. So we have four parathyroid glands in the body and they're, they all lie in the uh, posterior surface of the thyroid gland, okay? And this is how they look. Now, this is a, schema a schematic picture, but in real life, there is no clear boundary between the parathyroid gland and the thyroid gland. You cannot tell, oh, this is where the parathyroid gland starts and this is where the thyroid gland ends. And that's why one of the most common complications of thyroidectomy, which is the removal of thyroid gland, is the removal of parathyroid gland by mistake. That's why as soon as uh, thyroid gland is removed, this uh, doctor has to check for calcium levels to make sure that the parathyroid gland wasn't removed by mistake. Okay. Now about the histology of parathyroid gland, it has a fibrous capsule, as we can see over here. Let me use the little pointer. It has a fibrous capsule that extends inside, forming lob lobule, lobule, lobule. Okay. And it contains adipose cells. 20%, 20 to 40% of the gland is composed of adipose tissue or adipose cells. <clears throat> now, about the cells inside the parathyroid gland, we have two main uh, two types of cells. The first one is called the chief cell. And this is the important cell. This is the source of the parathyroid hormone. Okay, they're small and basophilic. In the lecture, it says they're less eosinophilic compared to oxyphils, 
they're basically basophilic, as you can see. They're blue. They're very easy to distinguish. So these are the chief cells, and they're the source of the thyroid hormone. The other type is oxophil cells, and these are large and eosinophilic, as you can see. This is one oxophil. This is another oxophil. They're large and eosinophilic. They have no known function. You don't know what their function is. They increase with age. And that's why the parathyroid function uh, decreases uh, with age because there, there will be more oxyphil cells and less chief cells, therefore less ability to secrete parathyroid hormone. Okay. Now, how is parathyroid hormone secreted? We said that parathyroid hormone secreted to increase calcium. So... It makes sense for it to be secreted when calcium levels are low, okay? So the main stimulus for the secretion of parathyroid hormone is low calcium levels. Now, normally, we don't need to secrete parathyroid hormone. We don't want a lot of parathyroid hormone in the blood. But what happens is when calcium is increased or normal, they bind to this very special receptor called calcium sensitive receptors or sensors, okay? Now, these are only found in the parathyroid gland and in the kidney, okay? Now, these, uh, these receptors, once calcium is normal or high, when, when, when calcium is bound to them, they, uh, seek, they, they form secondary messengers that you don't, know, that you don't need to know, these secondary messengers, and they cause PTH degradation and they inhibit PTH release. Okay, so normally, PTH is constantly being degraded and inhibited from release. Okay, but what happens if there's low calcium? These sensors are very, very sens sensitive to calcium changes. Okay, so any slight decrease in calcium, they'll sense. Okay, and no calcium will be bound. Therefore, no uh, secondary messenger will be released, and therefore PTH will be released. Okay, simple as that. So when there's calcium, PTH is degraded and inhibited from release. When there is no calcium, PTH is released. So this is what I said. Uh, parathyroid gland is lined with calcium-sensitive receptors. They're also present in the kidney. This is important. Increased levels of calcium will lead to the release of a secondary messenger that will degrade and inhibit the release of PTH. Now, if you want to secrete it, there has to be decreased levels of calcium, a relaxed uh, uh, calcium receptor, and less secondary messenger, and therefore PTH is no longer degraded and is released. All clear until now? Uh, I have a question. Uh, right. What's the function of the parathyroid hormone? Increase calcium. As we said here, uh, the regulation of calcium, PTH increases calcium levels. That's the main function. Let's we'll yeah, talk but, about parathyroid hormone in yeah, detail. But, but uh, how does it increase it if it's only like uh, you can only get calcium from the dietary uh, intake? Okay, we'll talk about each of these hormones in detail and exactly how they increase casting. So, okay, thank you. So now we'll talk about calcium regulation. Now, this is the most important part of the lecture. If you want to skip the rest and only listen to this, then that's okay. So calcium regulation. Uh, as we said, the three main, I mean, the three main organs for calcium regulation are the parathyroid gland, because it secretes the parathyroid hormone the kidney, and the bone, okay? And so first, let's talk about the bones. Uh, before we talk about the regulation, we need to know the normal function of bones. So bones are constantly in a remodeling state, okay? It's broken down and remodeled, or reformed. Broken down and reformed constantly, okay? And how is that? First, let's uh, get to know the cells in the bone. We have three, three main cells in the bone, osteoblasts, which are the stem cells of bone cells, okay? Osteocytes, which are just bone cells, and osteoclasts. And these act as the macrophages of a bone, and also they're the bone, uh, they're the cells that are responsible for bone resorption or breaking down bone. Okay. Now these uh, osteoclasts have a very special structure, as you can see. It has a non-resorptive border over here and a resorptive border that that is also called the ruffle border because it looks ruffled. Now, this border is responsible for breaking down bone. Okay, so how is this uh, process initiated? First of all, uh, we need we need to know rank and rank L. Rank is a receptor that's present in osteoclasts. Okay, it's just a receptor that's present in osteoclasts. Rank L is called rank ligand. So it's the ligand that binds to the rank receptor. 
Okay, all good so far. Now, where does rank L come from? They come from osteoblasts and osteocytes. Okay, once rank ligand binds to rank, osteoclasts activate and start resorbing bone. Remember, so this is the sequence. Rank L is secreted from osteoblasts and osteocytes, bind to rank receptor on osteoclasts, and start bone resorption. Come on. So what happens when rank, uh, rank L binds to rank exactly? First thing that happens is that a sealing zone is formed, okay, or resorptive uh, resorption compartment. You don't want the osteoclasts to go crazy and start uh, breaking down all the bones, right? So you need to confine the area where it will resorb, and that's done by sealing zones uh, that are basically proteins, integrins, called alpha, D, beta, 3 integrins. This name is, isn't very important. All you need to know is that these proteins form the sealing zones, and that will confine where the osteoclasts will act. Okay. The second thing that will happen is inside the cell, we have two important molecules that break down the bone, called cathepin and MMP. When, once rank L binds to rank, these molecules will be secreted into the resorptive pit and will start breaking down bone. Another thing that happens inside the osteoclasts is carbonic anhydrase reaction. I'm sure you're familiar with it by now, where carbon dioxide and water form uh, hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Okay, So the hydrogen uh, bicarbonate is exchanged with uh, chloride ions. And the hydrogen ions uh, are just formed, okay? And chloride ions go into the resorptive compartment via chloride channels, just chloride channels. And H plus go via uh, ATPA H plus channels, okay? Now, what happens when H plus and Cl minus are both here? They react to form hydrochloric acid. And we know that hydrochloric acid has a digestive function. It digests things, okay? So we established that three things absorbs or resorbs one. One, cathepin, which is just stored in the osteoclast. Two, MMP, which is also just stored in the osteoclast. And then hydrogen and, uh, I mean, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. And we saw how that forms. Ah. So bone resorption clear. Anyone have any questions? Clear. So this is what I said, just put into words. Rank L is released from osteoblast and osteocyte and binds to the rank receptor and osteoclast that activates osteoclast, forming a resorptive pit, okay, which is formed by sealing zones, alpha, B, beta, three integrins. It's not very important to memorize this name, just know how it looks like. Then carbonic anhydrase is activating, uh, activated, forming uh, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate is exchanged with Cl minus, and hydrogen is uh, is just it goes into the resorptive pit, uh, and they form hydrochloric acid, which also desor uh, resorbs the bone. Finally, we have cathepin K and MMP, which are resorbed into uh, which are released in the resorptive pit. Now, what is broken down? What do we get when bone is broken down? We said it's the main storage for calcium, so we get calcium. We also get phosphate. Okay, so these uh, molecules, calcium and phosphate, are endocytosed into vesicles and then exocytosed to the other side to the blood. So this is how bone resorption increases calcium. All clear until now? Okay. So now how does bone reform? Obviously we just we don't want to just break down bone and not reform it. Uh, so if you want to reform uh, bone, we just need to stop osteoclast from, from uh, acting, okay? How do we do that? By preventing rank L from binding to rank, okay? As simple as that. If we prevent rank L from binding to rank, we'll stop bone resorption, and we will start reforming bone, okay? And what stops rank L from binding to rank? A molecule called OPG, or osteoprogen... Let me, let me read the name osteoprotogerin, whatever, okay? So OPG is released, is also released by osteoblasts and osteocytes, and it binds to rank L, and preventing it from binding to rank. So we can say basically that osteoblasts and osteocytes, they activate osteoclast, and also osteoblasts and osteocytes deactivate osteoclast. So it's both activates and deactivates osteo, 
a class depending on what we want to do. Once osteoclasts stop functioning and stop resorbing bone, osteoblasts, which we said are the, the stem cells of bone, just form a canopy like this. Then boom, they, they go down into the resorptive pit and replace the broken, the broken bone. Okay, so bone reformation is simple. Bone reformation and bone resorption together is called bone remodeling because we took out a part and remodeled it with another part, okay? So this is what we said, osteoprotogenin, which is also called OPG, is released by osteoblasts and osteocytes. It binds to rank, um, rank ligand, preventing it from binding to rank, uh, therefore inhibiting resorption. Then osteoblasts just simply replace the resorbed cells. All good so far? So this is the normal function of uh, bone, okay? So we said that PTH increases calcium levels. Which process do you think it will stimulate? Bone resorption or bone re uh, reformation? We have someone that says reformation. Remember, once we break bone, we release calcium. Yeah, exactly. It increases bone resorption. Okay, because one of the products of breaking down bone is calcium. And the whole point of PTH, uh, parathyroid hormone, is to increase calcium. So if breaking down bone will increase calcium, then it will stimulate the breakdown of bones. Okay, how does it do that? Does, can anyone guess? It's very simple. How does it increase uh, bone breaking down, bone resorption? Okay, simply it just increases the amount of rank ligand. Okay, we said that rank ligand is the molecule that binds to osteoclasts to make it resorb bone. So what PTH does is it basically increases the production of rank L. As simple as that. How does it do that? We have a very important receptor called PTH receptor, or PTH1 receptor. And this is present in the bone and in the kidney. <clears throat> okay, now PTH1 receptor, once PTH binds to it, uh, it will stimulate the production of rank L, uh, which will uh, increase bone resorption. More bone resorption equals more calcium. As simple as that. Okay, so does that answer your question? Uh, I think someone asked me, Salman, you know, how, how PTH increases calcium. This is how it does it. It breaks yeah, down it, more bone. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So, so let's summarize. We said that uh, PTH points to PTH1 receptor on osteoblasts and osteocytes, stimulates the release of rank ligand, increases bone resorption, more bone resorption equals more levels of calcium in the blood. Now, we said PTH1 receptors is also present in the kidney. So it makes sense that PTH will also act on the kidney. So it, it's present in two places in the kidney, the thick ascending loop. I hope you didn't forget renal and uh, the distal convoluted tube. These are the two parts of the kidney that have PTH1 receptors. Now, when PTH1, uh, when PTH binds to the receptor in the thick ascending loop, it will... Uh, uh, cause the formation of CAMP, which is the secondary messenger, that will stimulate the reabsorption of calcium. So this is the lumen. Now calcium is leaving. Thus, it will leave through urine. When PTH binds to the ascending loop, it causes the reabsorption of calcium into the blood, Okay, and therefore increasing blood calcium levels. How does it do that? By increasing the paracellular reabsorption in the thick ascending loop of hemp. Okay. Another place it acts, now this is a bit more complicated, is the distal convoluted tubule. Let's first look at the normal function of how calcium is normally reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule. This is the lumen, and this is the blood. Okay, We have one channel in the luminal membrane called TRPV5. Get familiar with these names because they're, they're going to get repeated again in other hormones as well. So TRPV5. This is the luminal channel that allows the entry of calcium. Once calcium enters the cell, it binds to a protein called calbindin, which takes the calcium to, to the channels in the vasolateral membrane, 
we have two channels in the basolateral membrane. One is called PMCA4, okay, which reabsorbs calcium actively, active transport, it needs ATP. And we have another channel that's not active transport called NCX or sodium calcium exchanger. Okay. Now this uh now this is the pathway of calcium. So it's uh, reabsorbed through TRPV5 in the luminal membrane, binds to calbindin. Calbindin takes it to these two channels and therefore it's reabsorbed in the blood. Okay. Now how does PTH increase the reabsorption in the kidney? Okay, first of all, do we want PTH to increase or decrease reabsorption in the kidney? Uh, no, we want it to decrease. Okay, so uh, PTH, okay, so sad says increase. So PTH, the main function of PTH is to what? Increase calcium levels in the blood, sorry? So do you want more calcium to leave in urine or less calcium to leave in urine? Less. Less calcium. So that's why PTH increases the reabsorption of calcium from the lumen to the blood. Okay? It doesn't let uh, calcium leave in urine. It reabsorbs it. So how does it do that? Again, through the CAM pathway, it increases the activity and the number of TRPV5 in the membrane the luminal membrane, and therefore increases uh, calcium levels. Okay, but so guys, vitamin D, do you remember what, uh, do you remember uh, what it does? Does it increase or decrease calcium? Increase. Also, it also increase. increases calcium. Okay, so we also, vitamin D also uh, increases the reabsorption of calcium in a distal convoluted tubule, but it does, it does that uh, via another mechanism. It uh, increases the number of calbindin. Okay, so if you have more protein that carries calcium to to the channels in the basolateral membrane, then uh, we'll have more reabsorption. Okay, so both PTH and vitamin D act on the distal convoluted tubule to increase calcium reabsorption because they do it in different ways. PTH binds to the PTH one receptor and increases the activity and the expression of TRPV five on the luminal membrane. Vitamin D increases the number of calbindin. Uh, and if you have more protein that carries calcium to the basal lateral membrane, then you have more reabsorption. All clear until now? Okay. Now, uh, this is a summary. In the thick ascending loop, PTH stimulates CAMP, which increases paracellular reabsorption, so between the cells. Uh, DCT, this is a computer tubule, PTH stimulates CAMP, which increases the activity of TRPV5. Vitamin D increases the activity of calbindin. Now, there's one more hormone we didn't talk about and we'll talk about soon enough. It's called fibroblast growth factor. Okay. And uh, this binds to something called the clotho complex and stimulates the expression of TRPV, just like a uh, parathyroid hormone. So there's something over here called the clotho complex, that this fibrobla fibroblast, fibroblast growth, growth factor will bind to it and will increase the number of TRPV5 in the luminal membrane, and therefore increase calcium reabsorption. Uh, you don't need to know much about this fibroblast, fibroblast whatever it's called. Uh, now I'll talk more about it later. Now the main thing, and the main action of PTH on the kidney, other than increasing the reabsorption of calcium, is that it stimulates vitamin D secretion. Vitamin D is also a very important hormone uh, in calcium regulation. Okay, now let's talk more about vitamin D. So the only thing things we've established about vitamin D right now is that it increases calcium levels by increasing the reabsorption in the kidney, and that it's stimulated by PTH. Yeah, okay? PTH stimulates vitamin D secretion. So what is vitamin D, Osman? Vitamin D, another name for it is 1,2,5-dihydroxycalciferol. Okay, that's another name for it. But the, the name isn't important. What's important is this first point, 1,2,5-OH. Uh, okay, I'll tell you why in a minute. So vitamin D, the sources is dietary intake, and also it's synthesized in the skin when exposed to UV light or sunlight. 
Okay, that's why they say, oh, you don't want vitamin D deficiency. You have to get exposed to the sun because it can be synthesized in the skin if you're exposed to UV light. And the other source is dietary intake. Actions of vitamin D. First of all, the net action, we all agree that it increases calcium level in, levels in the blood. Right? We all agree on that. How does it do that? First, it increases bone remodeling okay, by increasing rank L, just like PTH. Okay. So it has the same action of PTH on the bones. It increases calcium by increasing bone remodeling. The second thing it does is that it increases calcium absorption from the kidney. And we already established that, صح? I don't need to explain that again with vitamin D. The third thing it does is that it increases calcium absorption from the GI. Now, this is important because only vitamin D does this. And that's another way PTH increases calcium is indirect way is by stimulating vitamin D, which then increases the absorption from the GI, okay? So PTH does not directly act on the GI. It acts on the GI through vitamin D, through stimulating vitamin D. Uh, the last thing is that it decreases PTH synthesis. You will ask why I want to increase calcium level. Why do I inhibit PTH? This is the feedback loop. If, I, if a hormone stimulates a hormone, that same hormone will go back and inhibit it. Okay, because it doesn't want too much P too many, too much PTH in the blood. Okay, so this is just, just feedback inhibition. Uh, it's stimulated by increase in PTH levels, hypocalcemia, and hypophosphatemia. Okay, it increases increase in PTH levels. We already mentioned that uh, hypocalcemia. Why? Because vitamin D's function is to increase calcium in the blood. So if there's low, if it senses that there's low calcium blood uh, levels in the blood it will be secreted to increase the level of calcium again, and hypophosphatemia. So it also increases phosphate levels in the blood. Okay, This is the main difference between PTH and, uh, and vitamin D. Okay, They have uh, pretty much the exact same function, which is increasing calcium levels in the blood. However, PTH inhibits phosphate, uh, phosphate reabsorption, while vitamin D increases phosphate reabsorption. And we'll mention that in a bit. So vitamin D clear until now. As we can see here, vitamin D acts on intestine, kidney, and bones, while PTH acts on the kidney and bones. And all of this is to increase serum calcium. All good? So, yeah, all good. So vitamin D metabolism, how is it formed? So we said it has two sources, صح? Okay. We said it has two sources, skin, uh, synthesis from the skin through UV light or diet. Okay, So the form uh, that so when, when you're exposed to UV light, okay, we have something called pro-vitamin. So something before vitamin D that's for, uh, that, that forms cholecalciferol when exposed to UV light. Okay, And we also have ergocalciferol, which is just the vitamin D you eat in the diet. Okay, once you have these two in the blood, these are inactive forms of vitamin D. These aren't vitamin D. These are just inactive forms of vitamin D. Both cholecalciferol and ergocalciferol. They go to the liver and a hydroxy group is added to the 25th carbon. That's why it's called 25-OH vitamin D or calciferol. Okay, so 25 hydroxy calciferol. This is also an inactive form. It's yet not active. The only active form of vitamin D in the body is 125 dihydroxy calciferol. Okay, you see what we did from here to there? We added a hydroxy group to the first carb. Okay, hence the name of the enzyme that does this, 1-alpha hydroxidase. And where does this take place? In the kidney. You remember we said that PTH, one of its main functions on the kidney is activating vitamin D or stimulating the release of vitamin D. This is how it does it. It stimulates the action of 1-alpha hydroxidase forming the active form of vitamin D, which is 1,25-dihydroxycalciferol. Okay, this is why this part is important. If it only says 25, it's non-active form. If it says 24,25, that's also an inactive form of vitamin D. Okay, and this happens when we don't want vitamin D in the blood. Okay, so this is, uh, if you remember from Endoripro, there's T3 and reverse T3. We, we sometimes have reverse T3 to inactivate thyroid hormone. This is the same thing. We inactivate vitamin D 
by 24 alpha hydroxylase. Again, from the name, it adds it adds a hydroxy group to the 24th carbon. Therefore, it's called 24, 25 dihydroxy calciferol, and this is an inactive form. Okay. Now, this active form, we said all of its function. All clear until now. So let's summarize. We have cholecalciferol, which is synthesized from UV light uh, from the skin, and ergocalciferol, which you get from diet, are converted into in, an inactive form of vitamin D in the liver, which is 25 hydroxy vitamin D, okay, or calciferol. In the kidney, they are converted into the active form via 1 alpha hydroxylase, okay? Now, 1-alpha-hydroxylase is stimulated by PTH because we said PTH stimulates vitamin D release and synthesis from the kidney, and it's inhibited by high calcium levels. If you have high calcium levels, why do you want vitamin D? Okay, relax. We want to stop it. Fibro fibroblast growth factor 23. Again, it comes again. And vitamin D itself as a feedback loop. Okay? So... It may also be converted into inactive form via 24-25-dihydroxy, uh, di I mean, 24-alpha-hydroxylase, 20, 24 okay? So this point is the most important point. At one alpha hydroxylase is what makes vitamin D active, and it's stimulated by PTH, and it's inhibited by calcium levels, which makes sense. I don't want you to memorize this. I want you to understand it. Okay, if you have high calcium levels, it inhibits vitamin D, it inhibits parathyroid. Anything that would increase calcium blood, I don't want it. So it will inhibit it. And then fibro, fibroblast growth factor 23 and vitamin D itself as a feedback uh, mechanism. So now we spoke about how vitamin D is formed and where it comes from. All clear? Clear. Now let's talk about uh, the action of vitamin D. Okay, vitamin D acts in four places, the kidney, and we already said how it acts on the kidney, صح? it increases reabsorption by increasing the activity of calbindin, and the second action, which is on the bones, we already said how it does that as well, is by increasing rank L, just like parathyroid hormone. The third place it acts is the intestines. So this is, uh, these are the intestines, okay? The receptor for vitamin D is called vitamin D receptor. Because the difference between this and the parathyroid hormone receptor is that VDR is intracellular. So vitamin D enters the cell and binds to the, this receptor inside the cell. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the channel that reabsorbs calcium in the intestine is called TRPV6. Okay. What's, what's the one in the kidney? What is it called? Does anyone remember? Is it the TRPV5? Excellent. TRPV5. Okay. So now TRPV5 in the kidney, TRPV6 in the intestines. Once calcium is uh, reabsorbed over here, then it binds to calbindin again, and calbindin takes it to the to the same uh, receptor on the other side, I mean, the channel on the other side called PMCA. Remember? So it's basically the same mechanism as the distal convoluted tube. What, uh, what, what vitamin D does is that it increases the expression of TRPV6 and calbindin. Okay, this is how it increases calcium uh, or absorption from the, from the intestines. Now, more calcium, uh, because of increased TRPV6, will have more calcium entering on the other side. And another way it uh, increases calcium reabsorption is paracellularly as well. Okay. So it's, it all follows a pattern. Yeah. The mechanism of action, it all follows a pattern. We already saw this in the kidney, and we're seeing it again. Vitamin D binds to, binds to uh, VDR, which increases the gene expression of tight junctions and aquaporin that will stimulate the absorption of calcium paracellularly. Okay. So transcellularly and paracellularly, both, both ways vitamin D stimulates. Uh, Okay, so I was saying that vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium both transcellularly and paracellularly in the intestines. Now, we said the fourth action of vitamin D is that inhibit, it inhibits parathyroid uh, hormone secretion and does that simply by uh, binding to VDR in the nucleus of the parathyroid gland chief cells and inhibiting mRNA transcription 
of parathyroid hormone, therefore inhibiting uh, parathyroid hormone synthesis and release. As simple as that. So vitamin D clear? That's, that's all you need to know about vitamin. That's clear. Now, uh, this calcitonin is the only hormone that goes towards the direction of decreasing calcium levels in the blood. Everything we spoke about so far increases calcium levels in the blood. Calcitonin, however, decreases calcium levels in the blood. So what is calcitonin? It's a hormone that's produced in the parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland, not parathyroid gland, thyroid gland. So in thyroid gland, we had follicles, and around the follicles, we had parafollicular cells, and these cells are the ones responsible for secreting calcitonin. And these cells are derived from a neurocrest cell origin. That's not important, you know. Uh, now, the actions of calcitonin are important. It's literally opposite of parathyroid. Anything that parathyroid does, calcitonin does the opposite, okay? So parathyroid increases bone resorption, calcitonin decreases bone resorption. And it does that by inhibiting carbonic anhydrase, so it doesn't play with rank L or whatever. It plays inside the osteoclast cell. It inhibits uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibits the H plus ATPase channel that you remember we said is on the basolateral or in the resorptive membrane of uh, the ruffled border. And if you can't uh, take out H plus, then hydrochloric acid won't form and you can't resorb bone. And it also inhibits osteoclast, osteoclast differentiation. Uh, basically inhibits osteoclast, simple as that. Uh, it also inhibits renal reabsorption of calcium. We said parathyroid hormone increases the reabsorption, this inhibits the reabsorption. And finally, it decreases plasma, uh, calcium, and phosphate. Okay. Uh, it also uh, inhibits the reabsorption of phosphate. Okay. Now, uh, regulation is relieved when calcium levels are increased. Okay. I don't know if this number is important or not. So, whenever calcium le levels increase, calcitonin is secreted because it's the only thing that decreases the calcium levels in the blood. Now, it can be used as a treatment for acute hypercalcemia. If for any reason you had a lot of calcium in the blood, and we said it's very dangerous because uh, it will cause arrhythmias in the heart, it will cause muscle spasms, it will cause a lot of things. So you don't want a lot of calcium in the blood. So uh, it's used as an injection uh, to treat acute hypercalcemia. So that's all you need to know about calcitonin, is it clear? Very simple formula. Now let's talk about the last hormone. Actually, let's first talk about phosphate. Okay, we spoke about calcium. Let's talk about phosphate. So phosphate mainly functions uh, in the, inside the cells. Okay, so it's the main ion inside the cells. It's needed for nucleic acid synthesis, ATP production. Remember, ATP as one is uh, triphosphate, uh, and it's a uh, substrate for kinases and phosphatases. So it's very important intracellularly. Okay, storage of phosphate is uh, eighty percent in the bones, also as hydro hydroxyapatite, and this is ninety nine percent of calcium. It's stored like this, and eighty percent of phosphate is stored like this, and twenty percent is distributed in the body tissues because, as we said, it's very important inside the cells. The regulation of phosphate, uh, we have two things that uh, decrease. Uh, phosphate levels in the blood, and only one thing that increases phosphate level in the blood. The one thing that increases phosphate level in the blood is vitamin D, okay? Because remember, in the gut, we said it increases the reabsorption of calcium. It also increases the reabsorption of phosphate, and we'll come to know how in a minute, okay? Uh, the, sec uh, the main thing that decreases absorption of uh, phosphate is the uh, PTH, and it does that in the kidney, in the pro proximal convoluted tubule. Now, a question for you guys. Uh, phosphate, I mean, PTH, increases calcium levels. Right? Why is there a need to decrease phosphate levels as well? Why can't we just increase the levels of both? That would be good. Okay, so what's the main function of PTH, increasing calcium levels, right? increasing the uh, free calcium levels in the blood. We don't just want calcium. If I get calcium that's inactive, what's the point? Right? I want active calcium in the blood. 
You remember at the beginning of the lecture? Yes, excellent, Razan. So that's called calcium can bind to phosphate, leading it to be inactive. Excellent. So parathyroid hormone, we want to increase the active form, the active calcium, active form of calcium. If I reabsorb calcium and also reabsorb phosphate with it, then what's the point? It will be inactive in the blood. So that's why I increase the calcium reabsorption, but stop the phosphate, uh, phosphate reabsorption. Therefore, you increase calcium and decrease phosphate, and therefore you'll have more free calcium in the blood. This point is important. Does, any, does everyone understand it? Yes. Okay. And the third hormone is again FGF23, which decreases the reabsorption of phosphate in the kidney. So this hormone came a lot, and we still don't know what it is. So let's let's talk more about this hormone. Um, actually, let's talk more about phosphate uh, first. So we said that. Uh, uh, Phosphate is reabsorbed in the intestines and in the kidney, okay? In the intestines, on the luminal membrane, we have something called sodium uh, phosphate uh, co-transporter, okay? Uh, now, this is active transport of phosphate and sodium inside, and it's stimulated by vitamin D. As we said, that vitamin D uh, increases PO4 absorption in the gut. This is how it does it. It increases the activity of the channels on the luminal membrane in the gut, uh, on the basolateral membrane, this channel, we have the sodium phosphate exchanger, and it also it can also be absorbed paracellularly. Okay. Now, in the uh, in the kidney, we have the luminal channels again, uh, sodium phosphate uh, exchangers, and in the basolateral membrane, we have uh, channels called PIT two channels. Okay, and PTH, we said. It, uh, does it inhibit or uh, stimulate the absorption of phosphate? No, it decreases the reabsorption of phosphate. Excellent. Okay, so how it does how does it do that? It inhibits uh, this channel, okay, uh, through the uh, protein kinase A and C pathway. So it. Uh, PTH binds to PTH1 receptor. PTH1 receptor activates protein kinase A and C. Protein kinase A and C breaks down these channels. Okay, so it inhibits the reabsorption. Now FGF also we said inhibits the pho uh, phosphate uh, reabsorption, and it also inhibits the these channels. Uh, but how does it do that? Uh, it uh, through the MAPK pathway. Okay. Now these details aren't very important, honestly. Um, just saying it because for the sake of completion, but the concept is important. What vitamin D does to phosphate and what PTH and FGF23 do to phosphate, that's very important. Come on. Uh, in the basolateral membrane, we have this channel called xenobiotic, whatever. Yeah, it's not very important. <clears throat> now, let's finally talk more about uh, FGF23. Okay, so the full name is fibroblast growth factor 23. Okay, from the name, it's bone derived. So the source of this hormone is bones. In the beginning of the lecture, we said it helps with regulating some hormones, bone. So this is the hormone that it secretes. It's called fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor 23. Uh, it's regulated through mainly through vitamin D and hyperphosphatemia. Okay, so the main goal for this hormone is to decrease phosphate levels, uh, as, as we see over here. Okay, it doesn't have to do with calcium. Not the have calcium. It mainly has to do with phosphate. So if you have hyperphosphatemia, it will uh, this this will be decreased, and it will uh, it will inhibit the reabsorption of para of uh, of phosphate in the kidneys. Okay. Vitamin D high levels of vitamin D will also stimulate uh, FGF. Okay. Actions inhibit kidney reabsorption of phosphate, inhibit PTH synthesis. Inhibits vitamin D synthesis. Uh, this is the feedback loop. As we said, if anything stimulates something, the uh, that same thing will go and inhibit it as a feedback mechanism. So why does it inhibit PTH synthesis? Can I want to guess? Okay, so basically, uh, uh, parathyroid hormone is going to increase calcium levels in the blood, صح? and it's going to increase uh, bone resorption. Now, bone resorption 
the the product of one resorption isn't only calcium. There's also phosphate. There's one minerals. Okay, so because uh, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, they uh, break down the bone and cause phosphate to be secreted into the blood. This doesn't want that. FGF doesn't want that. So it inhibits both PTH and vitamin D synthesis to stop them from breaking the bone. It doesn't care about calcium. It cares about phosphate. You increase phosphate, I don't want you. I'll stop you. So this is basically uh, it for FGF23. Anyone have any question? After the session, I recommend you all just go through each of these four hormones and see just their actions uh, because that will give you a big picture of what's going on, okay? So generally, PTH, vitamin D, they want to increase, increase calcium. FGF wants to decrease phosphate and uh, calcitonin wants to in, uh, decrease calcium. Well, that's that's the, the big concept. From there, you can uh, figure everything else out. Finally, the last part of this part of the lecture, estrogens and androgens, okay? So estrogens, their function is to inhibit the mat maturation of osteoclast and stimulates their apoptosis. So basically it inhibits osteoclast. So the net effect is inhibiting bone resorption because osteoclasts are responsible for bone resorption. Right? Now both estrogens and androgens also decrease the apoptosis of osteoblast and osteoclast. This function isn't important. I want you to ignore this. Just focus on this. Estrogens inhibit bone resorption. All good? That's why in postmenopausal uh, women, we have sudden less in estrogen, صح? So uh, postmenopause uh, is when خلاص, there's no more secretion of estrogen from the ovaries. Therefore, we have sudden loss of estrogen. So what happens? Osteoclasts are no longer inhibited and we have bone resorption and therefore bone loss. And that's why Osteoporosis is very common in old old uh, ladies because they have sudden loss in estrogen and bones start getting resorbed and resorbed and they're very prone to fractures okay? because there's nothing inhibiting the osteoclasts, not like before. Right? So bone loss is mostly cortical. Uh, if you know the parts of the bone, so we have the cortex and inside you have the trabecular uh, uh, and this is not very important. Uh, but what's important is this is why females lose more bone with aging than males. As they lose more estrogen, they lose more bone. Okay, why? Because normally estrogen inhibits bone resorption. No estrogen means bone resorption. Clear? Clear. So, خلاص, we finished the difficult uh, part of the lecture. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Because from now on, it's going to be very easy. It's going to be stating. Everything you from now is clear. So now let's talk about some uh, diseases. First of all, bone diseases. We have three main bone diseases. Osteoporosis. I'm sure everyone knows what's uh, osteoporosis. It's caused by an imbalance between osteoclastic activity and osteoblastic activity. The root cause of osteoporosis can be many things. It can be aging. It can be uh, a cancer, it can be uh, postmenopausal, uh, whatever. But the main concept of osteoporosis is that osteoclasts are more active than osteoblasts. So there is more bone resorption than, than bone reforming, and therefore we have progressive bone loss. The second thing, uh, rickets, if everyone heard of rickets as well, uh, it's caused due to severe vitamin D, calcium, or phosphate deficiency. Okay, these are the main components of the bone. If you have severe deficiency in those, will have a condition called rickets. Now, rickets only occurs in children. If we have severe vitamin D or calcium deficiency in adults, it won't be called rickets. It will be called something else. So this is important. Rickets, you cannot have rickets in an adult. It has to have, it have to have had happened in the in the past, okay? So it only occurs in children uh, and it needs to, it leads to abnormal bone growth because the epiphyseal plates still didn't fuse. And therefore, if you have bone deficiency before the epiphyseal plate even fused, you'll have uh, abnormal bone growth, and this condition is called rickets, okay? So mainly severe vitamin D or calcium deficiency. Finally, uh, osteomalacia, uh, and this is severe vitamin D and calcium deficiency in adults, so after uh, puberty, and this is characterized by both hyperosteosis, so basically some 
some parts of the bones are over uh, calcified. Oh, it has excess minerals, while some other parts of the bones are uh, delayed. Uh, it has delayed mineralization. Okay, we'll talk more about osteomalacia in the next, the next lecture, the third lecture. But uh, the cause is important. Severe vitamin D and calcium deficiency in adults. Okay. Now let's talk about calcium diseases. We have obviously hyper and hypocalcemia. Simple as that. Hypocalcemia can be caused by hypoparathyroidism. So a decrease in parathyroid hormone, which makes sense. Parathyroid hormone in, uh, uh, increases calcium. If you have less uh, parathyroid, then we have hypocalcemia. And the main and the most important cause of hypoparathyroidism is iatrogenic. Does anyone know what iatrogenic means? I mentioned this in the beginning of the lecture. Uh, treatment, by treatment. It's basically by uh, surgery. So a mistake or a complication of surgery. Remember when we said that during thyroidectomy, you remove the thyroid, but by mistake, you can yeah. remove parathyroid hormone as well. Uh, parathyroid yeah. gland. So this is the main cause of hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. Can also be autoimmune, something um, I mean, antibodies attacking the parathyroid gland, whatever. Vitamin D deficiency is also a very important cause of hypocalcemia, and that can happen due to lack of UV light, liver disease. Because you remember, we said that uh, once cal uh, cal uh, polycalciferol and ergocalciferol go to the liver, they have to get converted into 25 hydroxy in order to get converted into 125 hydroxy. So, if there's no liver, then there's no active vitamin D. And obviously malnutrition, uh, so low vitamin D in the diet. Uh, calcium deficiency obviously can cause hypercalcemia. Uh, this is due to chronic kidney disease. When the kidney cannot reabsorb calcium, it will cause hypercalcemia and malnutrition. Again, hypercalcemia, the most common cause is hyperparathyroidism. Okay, And this uh, can be due to primary hyperthyroidism, so an adenoma, of the parathyroid gland. I'm sure by now you should you know what adenoma or primary and this stuff are because you just finished under repro. So primary hyperthyroidism due to adenoma of the or tumor secreting parathyroid hormone or chronic hypercalcemia. You'll ask me why uh, chron chronic hypercalcemia can cause hyperparathyroidism. Uh, simply, when there is always always constantly uh, high uh, actually, this should be chronic hypocalcemia. Sorry. So fix it in your slides if you don't. I upload these ones. Chronic hypocalcemia. So when there is constantly uh, low calcium in the blood, uh, then the parathyroid gland, the sensitivity of the parathyroid gland to calcium is going gonna, is gonna to be low. Any, uh, I'm always secreting parathyroid, always secreting parathyroid to a point where halas, I don't care if there's low calcium in the in the blood or not, I'll just secrete because I've been secreting for too long now. Okay. So this is how chronic hypocalcemia can lead to hyperparathyroidism and eventually hypercalcemia. Uh, Non-parathyroid uh, causes can be to, to lung or bone cancer. Okay. Uh, now this is the last lecture. Looks complicated because it's a lot of new terms, but honestly, it's so easy. And you only need to know the concept. You don't need to know the details because the details are too advanced even for doctors. So just need to know the concepts. So the first thing we need to understand are bone turnover markers. Turnover just means remodeling. Okay. So markers in the blood that tell me if bone is being reformed or if bone is being uh, broken down. Okay. So the bone. Formation markers are three, mainly, osteocalcin, PINP, and PICP, or pro-collagen, because we know bone is made from collagen, صح? so if you have a lot of pro-collagen, that indicates that a lot of uh, bone wants to be reformed, okay? And finally, bone alkaline phosphatase, okay? So this is just memorization. If I was to memorize one of these, I'd memorize PINP, okay? Uh, bone, uh, bone resorption markers, we have two, CTX1 and NTX1, which are just other names for collagen. Okay, so C-terminal, whatever, collagen, and N-terminal, whatever, collagen. So collagen. If you have a lot of collagen, that means 
that a lot of bone is being broken down. That's why we have a high, high number of collagen in the blood. And uh, trapped 5B, okay? So this is the alternative of ALP on the site. Uh, simple enough, just memorization. Uh, the uses of bone, uh, bone turnover markers is to follow up with anti-resorption uh, treatment. So I give a treatment. So someone has, for example, osteoporosis, okay? Which means they have a uh, high bone resorption. So what do I do? So I give them medication. What do I do to check if this medication is working or not? I constantly check for the bone uh, formation markers to see if bone is being formed or not, okay? Now these medications, an example are denosumab and CATK inhibitors. Uh, when if they're working, there is going to be an increase in uh, PIMP. They're not working. There won't be an increase in PIMP. That tells you that the treatment is not working, and you should probably look for something else. They can they cannot be used for diagnosis. This is important. Okay, B uh, BTMs they only tell you if there's a problem or not. They tell you if a treatment is working or not. They don't tell you the diagnosis. If I have high, for example. Uh, NTX. Does that mean I have osteoporosis? No, it doesn't. It's not specific to any disease. It's only good uh, to follow up with treatment. That's the main cause. Uh, that's the main use of uh, BTMs. Okay? So I can see him asking a question and know which of the following can be used or uh, is good to be used for diagnosis. BTM, X. Okay? It's not, a, it's not an option. Now, BMD and DX. BMD is bone mineral density. Okay? And it's the amount of mineral per square centimeter in the bone. Okay, so it's just the density of the bone. And it's used to measure the bone strength. The higher the BMD, the, the stronger the bone. Okay? DXA stands for dual energy X-ray absorbi tometry. Right? Okay? So it uses two X-ray beams from the name dual X-ray. It uses two X-ray beams with different energy levels to estimate bone density from the absorption of each beam by bones. So this is a bone. I give an X-ray, okay? And then there's a, uh, there is a receptor on the other side, okay? If the bone absorbed a lot of this X-ray, that means the bone is strong. It's, the density is strong, you know? If If it doesn't and a lot of X-ray reaches the other side, that means the bone is weak, okay? So this can be used to tell me if the bone is weak or strong, okay? So it's a measure of bone mineral density. This is the gold standard for diagnosing osteoporosis. Okay, this is the most important tool and machine to diagnose osteoporosis. How is that done? Do you mind repeating it again? Okay, so we have the bone, okay? And this is the X-ray. My right hand is the X-ray, this is the bone, okay? Now X-ray, I'm gonna go to the bone, and on the other side, we have a sensor that uh, senses how much X-ray passed through, okay? Absorb, our absorbitometry means they want to see how much X-ray was absorbed and how much X-ray passed through, okay? If a lot of X-ray was absorbed in the bone and few a few X-rays passed through, that means that the bone is strong. That means that I have high bone mineral density. If, uh, if X-ray was not absorbed and it all passed through, that means the bone is very weak and they have low bone uh, mineral density. Around. Now, this is just the concept. What's important to know is that it's used Why for diagnosing. Use Why does it use Go two ahead. beams? I have no idea, Salah. But oh. this is the concept of how it works. Uh, now, the gold standard for uh, diagnosing osteoporosis is VXA because it gives me ac accurate values. Okay, So this sensor, it converts the amount of X-ray absorbed into numbers. Around. So... That way, I can quantify exactly how much the bone mineral density is. And that can be helpful for diagnosis. So how we do that, a score of minus 1 and above is normal, normal bone mineral density. A score of minus 1, uh, between minus 1 and minus 2.5 is called osteopenia. So this is the initial stage of osteoporosis. It's not osteoporosis yet, but there's weakness in the bone. There's weakness in bone mineral density. A score less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. This is very important. If you were to ask something from this lecture, I think it's going to be from this slide. Huh? A score less than minus 2.5 is diagnosed as osteoporosis. Okay, so this is how DXA is uh, used for diagnosing osteoporosis. Now, this isn't very important, but uh, like females and males, uh, children, uh, they have different 
uh, they have different cutoffs for what counts as osteoporosis and what doesn't. For example, females have to lose more bone for us to call it osteoporosis than, than men do. So how do they equate that? They use something called the Z-score, which compares the individual's bone density to what it's typically expected for in that age or that gender or that sex. Okay, This is very important. Just I just mentioned it because it was on the slide. Now, another machine. So this is for the extension. This is very important. Very, very important. Uh, another machine is CT, just CT. Uh, this is called computed computed tomography. Okay, this is uh, important. This is also this can also be used to diagnose osteoporosis, and this gives accurate measurements for bone mineral uh, density. Okay, and it provides uh, information about extra parameters like all of these. Okay, so let's just get an example. So for DXA, you don't get an image. You don't get an image. It's not an imaging. It's, it's called X-ray, but it's not an imaging technique. So you want to see how much X-ray is observed. This is an imaging technique. We can see that we get a lot of details from the CT. This is the cortex, and this is the trabecular bone, or the cortical bone, and this is the trabecular bone. We can see uh, a lot of things, like the fraction between the trabecular bone and the cortical bone. We can see the trabecular thickness. We can see the degree uh, of cortical thickness and so on. Okay, so we get physical characteristics about how exactly the bone looks like. Now, this is not used for diagnosis. Initial diagnosis is made is made by the XA. If we want to know how bad it is or like more features about what's going on, then we use CT. Okay, we use uh, qu a quantitative computer tom tomography. Tamam? Clear? <clears throat> now, MRIs and PET scans. Uh, MRI uh, is a non-ionizing uh, is non-ionizing imaging. Uh, this is useful for a pregnant because CT and X-rays you can't use CT and X-rays in pregnant uh, ladies or in children you can't. Okay, so an alternative can be MRI, and it's the same basically. It shows a high resolution image of what's going on exactly, like the cortical bones, trabecular bone, and so on. Okay, a PET scan or another word, uh, scintigraphy. Is uh, it uses radioactive tracers, uh, like they give an IV injection uh, that binds to bone mineral. Okay, and the excess, whatever, whatever uh, radioactive tracer that didn't bind will get excreted in urine, and therefore you'll have yeah, only the the bones that bond that was. So let me show you the image. So we gave the radioactive material. Okay, so in this image we gave the radioactive material, and it bond it was. It went and bond to bone, tamam? Now the rest would be secret, excreted. And you can see here that there are some black black spots. صح? Now these black spots, that means uh, there's no bone mineral in these black spots. That means there's bone deficiency in these black spots. And this is this can be used for diagnosis, tamam? So do you understand what PET scan is? You give a radioactive tracer through IV. The radioactive tracer binds to bone mineral. Whatever it doesn't bind will be uh, excreted, and then you take an image. And then this image, only the radioactive part will show. Whatever didn't bind will not show, will, be, will appear black. And this black means that there is a, a disease. Tamam? A lot of, you can see a lot of part of the skeleton, there is no, there is no bone. This is Paget disease. And they bring you a picture and tell you what, what disease this, is this. It's Paget's disease, which is characterized by the random spots of uh, demineralization in the body. See, I don't think you're asking about it. Now, another form of PET scan is like the opposite. Whatever uh, was bound to uh, uh, whatever was bound to the uh, to the tracer will not show. So you change the uh, settings in the machine. Basically, whatever was not bound will show as white. So all of these areas, all of these areas, are not bound to to um, uh, to radioactive material. And this disease is osteomalacia. We said that it's characterized by some parts being over, uh, over, like it has excess bone mineral and some parts don't have bone mineral. So this is osteomalacia. I don't think they're going to ask you. Either. Now for the final uh, machine or final test we use to see bone disease is bone histomorphometry. Uh, this is a biopsy taken from the iliac crest and viewed under microscope. Basically, histology. This is pathology. We call this pathology where we take 
uh, where we take parts of the body and see them under microscope. Uh, now we have two types of histomorphometry. We have static histomorphometry, which is used to gather physical information on uh, on uh, cortical and trabecular bone. So this is the cortical bone, trabecular bone. We just we want to see like uh, as the same as the CT, you know, the thickness or the uh, trabecular bone volume uh, fraction, and so on. Okay, and don't memorize these. Just get the concept. You know, these are physical characteristics of the bone. Uh, this dynamic histomorphometry makes the use of uh, labeling agents, again, radioactive agents. So they ask them to drink these radioactive agents, and after one day or so, they go and take the uh, habit from the radio crest. So this is just, they directly take it and do it. This, they put it under radioactive material, and this gives information on, like, physiological information. This is anatomical information and no physical appearance. But this shows, you see the spots over here, this shows you know, whether there's a uh, bone mineralization or uh, or not. So these areas, these spots, you cannot see over here, which you can see over here. This means that these areas in the bone are not mineralizing. Okay. So it gives information about mineralizing surface in the trabecular bone and also mineral acquisition and rate, which means you know how much new new bone is formed. It's not important. As I said, everything in this lecture, only the concept is important. The only numbers you need to memorize are the negative 1 and negative 2.5 for the DX. Uh, finally, osteomalacia diagnosis. The best way to diagnose osteomalacia is uh, by bone histomorphometry, unlike osteoporosis. What is it for osteoporosis? Let's see if you guys were focused. What's the gold standard for X, uh, the DXA? DX, DX, DX. Uh, so this is uh, before treatment or osteomalacia. You can see green means there is no, there is no uh, mineralization. So you can see there's delayed mineralization in these areas. This is after treatment of osteomalacia. You'll see that it became normal again. Like and that's it for the lecture. Does anyone have any question? La la. Thank you so much. So I just, I recommend you guys go over the slides after I finish because there was too much. Thick. This is three lectures in one. So uh, even if you understood, just go over the slides quickly, read over them and everything will stick in your brain, inshallah. Right, so just a couple of questions. A uh, 72 year old man uh, complains of abdominal discomfort. Physical examination reveals neuromuscular weakness. Laboratory studies show markedly elevated levels of serum calcium and parathyroid hormone. This polypeptide hormone is synthesized and secreted by which of the following endocrine cells? A, A, G subs. Excellent. Uh, your are asked to discuss your research on parathyroid gland pathophysiology at a national conference on aging and endocrine system. Which of the following cells is expected to be relatively more abundant in the parathyroid glands of an elderly patient a. compared to a younger patient? Oxyphil. Excellent. Oxyphil. Good, good. By which change would tend to increase calcium B absorption in the renal tissue? Uh, increased uh, vitamin, increased D. vitamin D. Does anyone have different answers? Okay. Sorry. Good job. So FGF23 increases calcium B absorption. What else does it do? It uh, decreases phosphate. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and obviously, decreased parathyroid hormone is wrong. Uh, and increased calcitonin levels is wrong. Because it does the opposite. Oops. Shouldn't good. Did everyone see the answer? Let's go. Uh, baby. Although this was the most difficult question. Okay, PTH does what directly? So tell me why is A wrong, why is B wrong, why is C wrong, so on. Why is A wrong? Where does this happen? Where does this process happen? 25 hydroxy. In the, in the liver, right? Okay, yes. And uh, where does... Uh, why is this? Why is B wrong? Because the PTH uh, isn't in the GI. 
تمام وات بي جي اي فيتامين دي جود جوب كنترولز ذا ريت اوف فورميشن اوف كالسيوم بايدنج بروتين ذاتس اولسو فيتامين دي كنترولز ذا ريت اوف فورميشن اوف 1 2 5 داي هيدروكسي كريسيتول ذاتس كوريكت اند ستيمولييت رينو تيودر فوسفيت ري ابزوربشن بالعكس it stimulates it inhibits the reabsorption pdh does not want uh phosphate uh calcitonin and parathyroid hormone both inhibit which of the following uh osteoclast no osteo osteo do this by elimination D. Renal phosphate absorption. Anyone have different answers? Ah, good job. It's renal tubular phosphate absorption. But that was it. Thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, please scan the QR code. Well, if you have any questions, you can always text me. My number is at the beginning of the slides. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. You made yes, the you can find few it. lectures uh, so easy. Thank you. Yeah.